All right. Good evening. Aren't you glad to be inside this nice, cool building and not outside with the RAs and the GAs right now? Um, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad to be back on our Wednesday night Bible study in Exodus. Um, now I just want to say thanks again to the guys who filled in for me uh, the last two weeks, for Larry for last week, and then Eric Richardson the week, I mean, not Eric Richardson, Eric Steffens the week before that. And they, I watched both of those videos, and they both did a wonderful job handling the text and taking us through the story. So very, very grateful for that. Tonight we pick up at chapter 16. So our goal was to get through 16, 17, and 18. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump right in because there's a whole lot of stuff here. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the time to be in your house and to study your word. And thank you for every soul that's gathered here. I thank you for those who are even watching at a later time. Thank you for our parents and our children, our workers out on the lawn uh, with the RAs and the GAs. And thank you for what you've been able to continue to do there even under these days. Thank you for the young people and the adults that are meeting uh, with our youth. And um, pray that you give in each location great time of discipleship and warm fellowship around your word. Be with us now as we continue through this book of your word and, and teach us the things we need uh, to glean from it. And Lord, not just open our minds, but our hearts to your story of salvation from beginning to end. And Lord, make us mindful of your word every day and let it penetrate just who we are and shape us as we walk with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've gotten the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they um, have escaped from Pharaoh's army. Right? They've, they've crossed the sea. Uh, now they are in the wilderness. And just as a reminder, in the book of Exodus, we have these first 18 chapters that lead us up to Mount Sinai, which is really a, a focus of this book, what happens there. You remember, that's where Moses first was um, met by Yahweh at the burning bush and given the commission and God revealed his name and sent him to Egypt and said, you're going to come back here. And so now this has been the journey to get back to Sinai. And then the rest of Exodus from chapter 19 to the end is that's where they are. Okay, so we're finally getting to the place where the rest of the book is going to take place. So in chapter 16, let's see. Oh, can you cut my monitor on up there for me? I, did, I failed to do that earlier. Chapter 16, the first thing that we see is they're, they're getting hungry. They're getting hungry. Now, we can imagine that when they left Egypt, I'm sure that they grabbed as much food that they could carry and provisions along with everything else. Um, but now it's been some time. It's been about 45 days or so uh, since that has happened. Uh, so they've left Egypt. Let's look at the first three verses there. And it tells us kind of what's going on here and that they're getting hungry. It says, they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. So they're, they're on their way to Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died in the hand of the, uh, hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Uh, so they're getting hungry. And you understand that. This is a lot of people. And they've run out of provisions, and they're beginning to get hungry, and they don't know what's going to happen so they're getting fearful about the uncertainty that's ahead of them they've been following Moses they've been following Aaron one step at a time 
you got to remember these are a whole lot of people they don't know the whole plan I don't think Moses even knows the plan they're just going one day at a time but what they do know is that they're running out of food and if you'd been there too you'd been grumbling too so don't get all self-righteous like I would never have done that we would have all started grumbling and wondering how we're going to eat how am I going to feed my kids tomorrow we're running out of food and, and so it's a natural thing. We get it. We're told that they grumble against Moses and Aaron, their leaders. And I'm going to kind of circle back to that and talk more about leadership and some lessons that we learn from these chapters about that. But Moses is going to constantly get the brunt as the leader of this grumbling. And he's going to constantly remind the people that although they grumble, they complain about him him uh, because he is the person that they see he's the one that's led this whole thing they're going to constantly he's going to constantly remind them you know what you're really who you're really grumbling against is the lord because that's i'm just following what god is telling me to do and that becomes a very very important theme uh, as we move along so then we get to this part of chapter 16 where we get this teaching this about the story about the, the bread from heaven of course manna is the name for this and God begins to reveal his plan uh, that he's going to make provision for them in food in the wilderness he's going to give them manna every morning look down in verse 13 uh, through 15 in the evening quail came up and covered the camp now that just seems to be a, a one-time thing but that evening all these quail came covered the camp and they were able to collect those and have those then it goes on and it says in the morning dew lay around the camp and when the dew had gone up there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake like thing fine as frost on the ground when the people of Israel saw it they said to one another what is it when they did not know what it was and Moses said to them it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat uh, so we have this thing called manna show up now manna in Hebrew literally comes from word that means what is it so when you say manna you're actually saying a Hebrew word that means what is it because that's what they said so you know how nicknames sort of stick it that just sort of stuck and that's what the children of Israel and everybody kept calling it is what is it because they didn't know what it was now the whole story of God giving the manna it's not as if God didn't know that's what he was going to do but the people are complaining and but the people are seeing how God's going to provide and he gives this manna it, it's a provision for them to sustain them it's going to sustain them for 40 years okay but it's also a test it's a lesson demonstrating uh, faith both in their daily collection of it and what happens in that double collection on the sixth day and so so you remember the story hopefully you've read this and you remember the instructions that God gave that this what is it this manna would appear in the morning so you, first of all, you had to get up. If you slept in, you missed, you missed the day's meal. So you had to get up, and you had to get out, and you had to work. I think there's a message in there, too. And, and collect this for you and your family. But the dew would settle down, and then as the, as the dew evaporated or changed in the morning, it turned into this, this manna, this flaky white what is it kind of stuff uh, that just covered the ground now again we're talking about feeding a lot of people a lot of people but it says from the Lord that they were to go out and they were collect an omer which is about two quarts per person in their family go out and collect that much per person each morning and then that's what you would eat that day. And then on the sixth day, the instruction was given, now go out on the sixth day and collect twice as much and don't collect any on the seventh day, the Sabbath. 
Now, what's interesting is God was testing them. He was building into them faith in a couple different ways. First of all, the natural human inclination is if you see all of this bread, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to re- go out there and you're going to fill every container that you have because we're a little like squirrels that way, right? We just, we're going to pack it away. Nobody knows what tomorrow's going to hold. We might need that. How many of y'all got deep freezes? All right, yeah, right, a deep freeze. They didn't have those, but they probably wish they did. And, and so you, you put that away because you never know what's going to come. But God is saying, no, you're going to trust me for each day. So I just collect enough for the day. Now, we know there were some slow learners, right? And, and they didn't follow directions, but God told them what was going to happen. If they collected too much overnight, the excess that they collected would become spoiled, described it as getting worms and stinking. So now you, you stunk up your whole tent, you know, whatever. And, and so that's no good. So he was teaching them six days a week, just trust me each day for what you need, and it'll be there the next day. But on the sixth day, he's, he, he actually does another miracle where normally it would spoil on the sixth day, he said, collect twice as much, and then God kept it from spoiling on the seventh day. So it would spoil any other day except the day he told you get twice as much because on the Sabbath, you're going to remember creation and God rested on the seventh day and you're going to rest on the seventh day. Now what's interesting is we haven't got to the giving of the law yet. So this is looking back at creation. It's also looking, looking forward Uh, to the law that's going to come in the fourth commandment when we get there. So that's very interesting how God is building faith into the people with the daily provision of manna. The people are also reminded here that that they have a heart problem with trusting the Lord. uh, And it's expressed in the criticism of Moses and Aaron. Every time you turn around, they're mad at Moses, they're mad at Aaron, they're mad at their leaders but they're reminded that it's really the heart problem they have with trusting trusting the Lord, trusting Yahweh. And that's a good reminder. It's not that Moses nor Aaron, and we know that because we know a lot of the story where they weren't perfect. It's not that they couldn't make mistakes and they didn't have to learn too. But when they displaced on their leaders, when, when they grumbled and complained, and Moses even at times felt like his life was threatened, The problem was is they were really not trusting God with what was happening, but they were looking for somebody to blame. Um, And you know that that is true in human nature, right? If you're frustrated, if you're angry, um, you're going to find somebody to blame. Leaders are usually a pretty good target. And if that doesn't work, you go home and you kick the dog. That's at least what people used to do, all right? You can't do that anymore, I don't think. But, But you take it out on somebody somewhere, right? And that's what we see happening here every time something seems to be going wrong. Okay? I'll stop at the end of each chapter and see if you have any questions. The rest of the chapter, we keep seeing that manna is really a key to the, to, in a, as a spiritual image that not only is in the book of Exodus, but, but it's through the whole Bible. It's amazing how, this, how important this idea of manna becomes. Uh, manna experience was become a formative part of Israel's identity as the people of God. Manna would be the key symbol of God's provision for them. E- even by the time we get to the New Testament, in Judaism, manna is still that symbol uh, of what God did way back then in such a miraculous way to provide for God's people and, and the idea that It becomes a symbol for God's provision for his people all the time. That's how important it is. Uh, We know that a sample of it, right, gets placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Right, go on down, go down to verse 33 and 34 at the end of the chapter. We get kind of a summary at the end. It says in verse, beginning verse 33, And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations and the Lord commanded Moses so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept 
Um, now, we don't have the ark yet, right? The tabernacle, the ark, all that comes at the end when it gets built. But even here, when the manna first come, at some point, somewhere, it's not real specific, but at some point, they, they collected a sample of it and kept it that eventually would be put in the ark. The testimony mentioned there is most likely a reference to the actual tablets, the Ten Commandments, that it was placed with that. And it was kept until, it was kept near God, it was kept safe until the ark was actually constructed and made. And then we know that it was put in there along with um, Aaron's uh, staff that had budded. And think about this. It tells us at the end of the chapter that this was their daily exercise for 40 years. 40 years. Um, I hope you like manna. I mean, I guess that's what I'm hoping, you know. But we're told that it did taste good. Do you remember what it said in your read? It was sweet. It said it was like a, a wafer type of thing, which would we would call that a cookie, like a biscuit, the English would call it, with, with a hint of honey. That sounds pretty good. Um, honey would have been a luxury. They, they didn't like cultivate honey and beehives think but you know you get honey in the wild it would have been a, a real delicacy and treat um, so apparently it had a, a nice texture and flavor to it and it was it was pleasant so the Lord did give them something that was tasty we believe it seems to be but for 40 years this is this was their diet and it's interesting because you know God knows us he knows our bodies one of the things I think about was well how could this be a good diet how could this be a healthy diet? You know, just this one, what is it for 40 years every day? Well, apparently it was just fine. <laughs> apparently whatever was in it was sufficient, you know, to, to keep the body healthy and keep the body strong and all of this. So who knows what was in it? it maybe it was like a multivitamin too. I don't know. But God put good stuff in it apparently, and it apparently tasted good too. Uh, but the, for 40 years, they get to do this every day, every day. Can you imagine that? Um, but God is teaching them patience. He's teaching them to trust him in an unbelievable way. Because you've got to remember, these people know nothing about God. Very little. Remember how long, how many generations? I mean, these are 20-some generations removed from Joseph. Uh, there has been no word from God for over 400 years. And all this stuff now is happening really quickly. And God is teaching a whole new generation about himself. It appears that even the name of God wasn't really remembered. And they're learning all of this over again. And I think the lesson of the manna, this daily ritual and exercise in faith, is key to what God is doing uh, with the people. The double collection before the seventh day, I already mentioned this, uh, of the week, it looked back to creation. It also foreshadowed the law that was coming at Sinai. And then what I really want us to think about here is how the manna foreshadowed Christ who identified himself as the bread from heaven. I mean, this is the thread that you see throughout all of Scripture. So, so take your Bible and go to John 6. And this is amazing how this connects. If you have time later, maybe this evening, read the whole chapter of John 6, particularly beginning at verse 22. But I'm just going to read some snippets of it to give you the idea. Jesus has fed the 5,000. And, of course, once he did that miracle, the people really liked him, you know, because they saw him as the guy who's just going to feed everybody. And uh, so they're really going after him, and they want to make him king and all of this kind of stuff because he can feed them, and that's an amazing thing. But Jesus takes that miracle. He takes the Jews' understanding of their own history and of this spiritual image of manna and God's provision, and he uses it to teach them about himself as the bread that has come from heaven. Look in verse, uh, start in verse 13. 30. So they, the, the people, said to him, to Jesus, 
then what sign to you uh, do you do that we may believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, if not, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So you see what Jesus is doing there. He knows that they know the story about the manna. They, they, they know that by heart. That, that is part of who they are, the story of the exodus, the story of the wilderness, the story of the manna that God supernaturally provided. Jesus, it reminds you a lot of his conversation with the woman at the well when he talks about water, and she says, well, give me that water. That sounds really good. Well, here it's the same thing. Well, hey, you know, you got some bread like that. Give, give us some of that bread. But again, Jesus says, you're looking at that. It's, it's me. I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. Going down to verse 41, and you see the reaction. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say I've come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. Isn't that interesting? They're grumbling. Children of Israel grumbled. You know, there's a lot of parallels. Do not grumble among yourselves. Verse 44, no one can come unto me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And then go down to verse 48. Just another little section. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then Jesus goes on to talk more about how you have to partake of his flesh and his blood and he grossed them out even more and they didn't understand. But it's symbolic and Jesus is connecting the story in Exodus, all of this heritage to himself. And we again see how this is one story. These aren't a bunch of different stories, although they are different stories. There is this thread of Messiah, the thread of promise, this, this Christ that is in the Old Testament as well as the New. Jesus didn't just show up in the New. He's present in the Old. And we're going to see that some more here in the next chapter. But the manna, the image of manna is so important to Jesus as the bread of life. And there's even some other things before we leave this chapter. New Testament connections to the manna. We just said Jesus is the bread from heaven. But you remember what Jesus taught us to pray? What did he teach us to pray? Now, there's several things in that model prayer, but what's one line that should be sticking out to you right now? Give us this day our daily bread. That is certainly an allusion to the manna in the wilderness that they collected daily. And Jesus taught us to pray with that kind of faith, as if we needed to collect just what we needed for today, ask God just what we need for today, not to worry about tomorrow, which Jesus tells us that a lot as well, but give us today our daily bread exactly what we need. And it's interesting, part of the miracle that happened there that's described in chapter 16 with the manna is that whatever the people collected, if they faithfully collected it, that they never had too much, they never had too little. That God made it work just right for what they and their family needed, day after day after day after day for 40 years. Isn't that amazing? But they had to trust God every day uh, for that provision. 
And then I think there's a connection here too because certainly the Lord's Supper is most directly connected to the Passover. When Jesus celebrates the Passover, remembers that incident in Exodus when the angel passed over the children of Israel because of the blood and they were able to leave Egypt. But yet it's also bread again. It's bread. And Jesus says, this is my, my body. He says, I'm the bread from heaven. When he institutes the Last Supper, he says, I'm, my body is like bread again that's given for you. So there's a lot of connections that we make in the gospel back to the story in Exodus and particularly to the idea of the manna that God sends from heaven. Okay, let me pause now in this chapter and let you ask any questions or any observations. Sure. Some 40 years. Mm -hmm. Every day. If God could have mixed it up, a little chocolate manna, a little vanilla, we already had honey, right? So, yeah. You know, I, Don, I bet there was a guy like you in the crowd. I bet there was a guy like you. I mean, there was a lot of guys there. <laughs> okay, the question is, did they have quail every night or just that one time? I think it's just that one time because it, the quail is not mentioned as something that repeats. On that one time, it says the quail covered in the evening um, and they gathered it, but then it goes on just to talk about the manna. So there may be a different opinion, but I, I think that indicates the quail was just kind of a one-time thing. They may have. They may have. There's no, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that they may have never eaten anything else. Right? But they had the manna as the staple for 40 years every day. That was, that was enough. But, um, yeah, they, yeah, there's a lot there we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Any other questions about the manna or... An omer I read is approximately a couple quarts, like a quart, you know, two quarts, half a gallon, is that right? Good question. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great comment, and I'm repeating it for the people, for the uh, folks that are watching on the videos. Your comment was not just the, the sin that we see, but people's forgetfulness seems to be something you observe over and over. It's like, hey, I mean, look over there. There's a cloud, you know, a Shekinah glory of God that's following you around. Don't you think you can trust him for a drink or for some bread? Or, and over and over and over, it is like the people are forgetful or at least not mindful. They're, they're, they're constantly in, in situations where instead of choosing faith, they're choosing to despair when the evidence of God has been all around them, going all the way back to their deliverance with the plagues, but they keep forgetting, it would appear. Yeah, yeah. And I always remind all of us as we read the Bible and we see those stories, don't think that can't be us. You know, we, we can be just, well, I, well, I'll speak for myself. I can be just like that. It's easy when you're afraid, when you're um, nervous about the future, whatever, to forget. You, you just forget and you despair. And um, that, that's just a good observation. Yeah. Mm, another good point, yeah. 
people have a lot but never seem to be satisfied. They always want more. It's a good point too. No, another part of our sinful human condition. <laughs> I think that comes out. That's good. Absolutely. All right, anything else about the manna before we move on to, to water? Nope? All right. Chapter 17, uh, we see the beginning of it. We get water from a rock. Uh, go to chapter 17, and let's look at verses just 1 and 2, kind of see what's going on there. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin. Now, literally, that's, you know, they're moving around in the wilderness of sin by stages. And you remember, God is leading them a little here and a little there. And remember, it's a bunch of people. It takes a lot of effort to break camp, move just a little distance, set up camp again. You know, it's a huge effort. So they're just moving a little bit, a little bit around the wilderness of sin. According to the commandment of the Lord, so they're following the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? So here we go again. Now we're in a different place. They're getting the manna every day, so food isn't an issue. Um, but now they're at a place where they can't find any drinkable water. Uh, so they're beginning to grumble. Uh, they grumble against Moses, against Aaron. They grumble, and they, Moses, of course, grumbles to the Lord. Um, so the solution that God gives, he's going to give them another sign. And so this time he instructs Moses to take the staff and to strike a rock there at Mount Horeb. So now we know they're at Sinai. Uh, Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. So they're in that area. Now the location of Mount Sinai has been disputed forever. I'm not sure if anybody knows exactly where Mount Sinai is. Kind of in the same way of, well, where exactly did they cross the Red Sea? You're, you're going to find a lot of different opinions about that and it just doesn't tell us in the text but they are now in the area of Mount Sinai called Horeb here and they're around probably the base of the mountain somewhere and if you've seen pictures of that terrain well there's lots of rocks it's it is bare and it's kind of dry uh, so one of these rocks he hits with his staff and water flows from it for the people so again God provides another miracle of provision for the people uh, so we see this pattern it's interesting the need begins to arise and the need is real whether it's they need food they need water but again like Mary was saying they're forgetful instead of praying or coming to Moses and interceding and saying how is God going to provide their their instinct their their sinful inclination is just to start complaining and grumbling and accusing rather than having faith that somehow God's going to pull this off he's been faithful to this point why wouldn't he pull this off too so there continues to be this doubting of Yahweh and Yahweh is time after time trying to show them that he is the Lord he is the one true God and you got to remember these are people who are coming out of a context where they believed in many gods. Now I know that they have a heritage all the way back to Abraham, that Yahweh is the one true God. But they've, <laughs> they've been in Egypt for generations and they've, they've grown up in a culture where that's not been the teaching. And I'm sure in many of their minds, they still are trying to be deprogrammed from that. Does that make sense? They, they've been shaped to think like that. And so in that world, in most places, where they believed in the reality of many gods, it wasn't so much of, you know, is there one real God? It's which one is the strongest God? It was more of the idea. We're going to see that kind of in Jethro a little bit later when he shows up in chapter 18 and kind of how he talks. 
But here, God is continuing to demonstrate his power. He started with the plagues to demonstrate to them and to Egypt uh, and to Pharaoh of his power that he is the most powerful God, leading them to understand that he is truly the only God, and all these other gods are not even real gods. But now we get to the water that comes from the rock. And again, here we get a Christological image. Uh, we, we know that it, it, again, is showing us Christ. Now, did they understand that at the time? I don't think so. But we see it revealed now. If you go to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and you'll see what we're talking about here. 1 Corinthians 10. Now, Paul, in the context of writing this first letter to the Corinthians, is talking about idolatry and things that they need to stay away from and all of these kinds of things. But in the midst of all that discussion, he gives them some history, again, about what we're reading in right now, and he makes this connection to Christ. So just beginning at the, the, the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Okay, this is the stuff we've been reading about. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, they, they, um, they were immersed in that context, that experience. They all ate the same spiritual food. That would be the manna. They drank the same spiritual drink. This is the, the water that we're reading about in chapter 17. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Isn't that interesting? The rock was Christ. The spiritual rock that followed them. Um, we don't think about this much, but what Paul is saying is that even then, because Paul was on the other side of the cross, Paul was on the other side of what had been revealed about Jesus Christ, is that Christ was there. Christ was there. How could Christ be there? Because he's God. If Yahweh was there, and he was, Christ was there. We might say the Spirit was there. God is three, but God is one. Christ was there. Christ was the rock. Christ was the source of the blessing they were receiving. Christ was uh, the source of that, that water. If you go to, um, to even farther to the back there, to the book of Jude, right before Revelation, and look at verse 5. Notice what Jude says here. Verse 5 of that one chapter book, he says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. You might say, well, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't there. Jude's messed up. He's, he's got his history kind of mixed up. The Bible clearly says Jesus did that. Both in the delivering, both in the judgment that happened back there in the book that we're reading about. And that is significant that Christ was there and that we get that connection. It's interesting. Jesus connects himself to the manna and Others in the New Testament, Jude, Paul there in Corinthians, connects him to the rock, to the water. It's interesting that Jesus himself in John 4 revealed himself as living water to the woman at the well. There's a lot of themes that begin to connect about the manna, about the water, about Christ. But what's most amazing is that the scripture teaches us that Jesus was there. Now, how many of you really think about Jesus being in the wilderness with the people of Israel? I mean, it's, we have a hard time getting our mind around that. 
But the Bible's pretty clear that that's exactly what was going on, where we serve a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And yes, they are three in person, and we get into the doctrine of the Trinity here, but yet they are one. Scripture teaches that Christ was in creation. He, Christ did not come into existence when Mary gave birth to the man Jesus, the incarnation. He pre-existed. He's involved from the very beginning. The New Testament makes it clear he's involved in this very important history and salvation history and the Israel's history there in the wilderness. Jesus is there. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. You got any questions about that? All right. It's hard to know what to ask, isn't it? It's just amazing. It's just something to be in awe of. Well, now we get to war. <laughs> and um, this is, to me, I'm reading this with fresh eyes thinking, well, this is unexpected. I mean, these people just show up and pick a fight. And, um, you know, what's going on with this? The, um, so we learn about that Israel encounters uh, these people who become hostile to them for whatever reason. Um, and uh, they're, they, they're called Amalek. Um, or the Amalekites, and if you probably don't remember, but if you go back to Genesis 36, you learn that Amalek was a grandson of Esau. So these are, now again, we're, we're really, really far away from Esau <laughs> and his grandson, but these are the people group in the region that bear his name. They are his descendants. And again, we're brought back into the book of Genesis with the hostility, the enmity between Jacob and Esau. Uh, here it is again showing up. Now, we don't get a lot of details about why these people attack Israel. Um, maybe they just see it as an opportunity to loot and pillage and take the things because, remember, the, they took a lot of good stuff out of, out of Egypt, remember? So maybe they had their eyes on their stuff. That's a possibility. Maybe they just saw them as a threat. This is a very large group of people moving through here. Uh, maybe it's just we need to show them that they need to keep moving on <laughs> and not be thinking about sticking around here. We, we don't know the motivations. We just know what happened. So we get this story of this battle. We get introduced to Joshua. Joshua's mentioned for the very first time. Apparently Joshua's been around helping Moses. It's, you can kind of infer that by the way that Moses just sort of goes to Joshua and says, hey, I need you to find all the guys that can fight and get these guys together. You got a day to do it. We don't know why he had a day. Uh, maybe the, um, the Malachites said, hey, you know, if you don't surrender stuff to us in a day, we're going to kill you. Or We don't know why he got a day, but he had a day to get them ready. And so Moses charges Joshua to get the men that he can ready to fight. And then they have this battle. And then we have this a very strange story, don't we, of the staff that Moses brings. He apparently comes to a, a hill near the battle scene, you can see the battle taking place. And he's holding up his staff, and as long as the staff is in the air, the inferior Israelites, who certainly were no army, not trained to be soldiers or anything like that, prevailed against a people group. I even read about the Amalekites that they had even ones that sort of domesticated and used camels in warfare. And that would have been kind of scary. These guys charging at you on camels. But, um, you know, so, but as long as Moses held the staff up, it says that Joshua and the Israelites prevailed. But when he began to lower it down, then the Amalekites prevailed. And so Aaron and then another new guy, Hur, had to come and help prop his arms up and set them up and, and keep his staff up way into the evening until they finally won the battle. Now let me ask you a question. What is that all about? Any ideas? Isn't that str strange? God's showing his control, okay. 
that gets a good answer. Yeah, a visual symbol of that it's God who's doing this, not you. And, and Moses and his staff becomes that symbol. Yeah. Does anybody think there's actually any magical power in Moses' staff? I think that'd be a, a wrong reading. I could see how you might think that. You know, like a wizard staff or something. But that, I think that would be the wrong thing. I, I think, Sherry, I think you've got the right idea. I think it's a visual reminder that God is doing this not you ragtag bunch of militia guys. Oh, but they would know. Not while they're fighting. I would say they were engaged while they were fighting. They probably weren't looking over at Moses' staff. Yeah. Um, but they certainly would have learned of it, I would think. And it certainly got written down. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, Mary. There may be some lessons there for Moses himself. He's about to get another one from his father-in-law. You know, maybe there is something in there that he doesn't have to do it all himself. Um, it can be a group effort. It, it's, a, it's fascinating. I do think the main idea is that for posterity and for, again, another demonstration that, you know, Israelite men, don't, don't think that you're winning this battle on your own. You know, God is the one helping you, causing you to get this victory. Um, I think that's the main idea. Um, but the staff keeps coming back as God uses that staff. And I think that's important too because it, every time that staff is used by God and the way he chooses to do that, he's also affirming Moses' leadership because it's his staff. It's Moses' staff. And I think that's also key as well. Okay, let's go to chapter 18 here. About 10 more minutes, we'll try to wrap this up. In chapter 18, we kind of shift gears, and the first thing we get is this family reunion. Moses has not been with his family. Remember, when he was on his way from Sinai to Egypt with his family, that was when they had a little trouble, remember? And um, Zipporah sort of saved the day with her, her quick intervention, um, but then it appears that they went back to Midian and Moses went on to Egypt. And so now we're, we're seeing them reunited uh, with Zipporah, his two sons, Gershom and Eleazar, and his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, if Jethro had a wife with him, she's not mentioned. Um, but they get reconnected at Mount Sinai, uh, the mountain of God, it's called in verse 6 of that chapter. And remember, God had told Moses, you're going to come back here. That, that something significant was going to happen back at Sinai. And now we're seeing this coming true. And so they get together. Moses recounts the Lord's deliverance. You can imagine this scene. He sits down with his father-in-law and his family, and he tells them the story of what God has done, how he made Pharaoh look like a fool and did all these plagues and brought him out of Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, I mean, that's some good stuff to tell. And, and so Jethro listens to all that. And then Jethro acknowledges that the Lord is the greatest God. Now, it's interesting how he says that. Um, let me see if I can find that be good if I was actually in Exodus. There we go. If you go down to verse 11, this is Jethro speaking. He says, Now I know that the Lord, the name of God, Yahweh, is greater than all gods, because in, the, in this affair they, the Egyptians, or the gods, dealt arrogantly with the people. So there's a hint that Jethro is still on a journey away from that polytheism he's kind of saying to Moses man wow that's amazing what your God has done your God is certainly the greatest of all gods 
but there's still that idea that there are other gods that's still sort of hanging on there. Um, so some people have talked a lot about, is this a, a conversion of Jethro? Is he certainly cert recognizing how the, the great things that Yahweh has done? Uh, we don't really know completely, I would say. I try not to go saying things beyond what the text actually says. Um, I hope that it was. Um, I think from what he said, he's sort of getting there. He's sort of on his way uh, to do that. And then after they have this reunion, they share the stories. Uh, Jethro makes sacrifices, and they have this fellowship together, and they honor Yahweh. Uh, then Jethro helps. He gives him some good counsel. Um, Moses has been, he's the leader. He's also the prophet because he's speaking for God. Now, again, he is speaking for God, and we're going to see this in, in this story, before there's even the law been delivered. So he's speaking for the Lord in a prophetic way. He's the priest. He's the one that's going to go before God. That's what a priest does. And now we're going to see he's also judge. I mean, he's, he's wearing all these hats. Um, and, and it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to bear. Um, so we know there are a lot of people. Remember, we've already been told when the exodus occurred, there was around 600,000 men. Now, that did not include women, did not include children. So most people think two and a half to three million people would be even a conservative kind of number. It's a lot of people. Okay, so you can see the, the headaches <laughs> that were there. Uh, Jethro offers some advice, and Moses listens. Remember what he says? He says, um, I'll paraphrase, man, you're going to kill yourself. You, you cannot keep this up. Uh, the people are coming to you from morning into the evening, bringing everything before you to get a word from the Lord, to get instruction. You cannot keep doing this. And he gives him a pretty sensible plan. Go find some godly men, wise men, men that are trustworthy, and let them help you. Um, set them up over certain divisions, and they get this sort of system worked out. Um, and they implement it, and lo and behold, it works. So the text tells us that then really only the big matters, really big, important, maybe more controversial things, made its way up to Moses. Moses kind of became the Supreme Court. You know, and, and, and when something just couldn't be handled at a lower level, it might make its way up to Moses when he'd have to deal with it. But remember, they're not, they don't have um, the word of God in a written form to guide them yet. Um, God is using people, particularly Moses, uh, to do that. And then Jethro goes, he goes back home. All right. Now, let's just quickly go through some takeaways, uh, some applications from these three chapters. Uh, first of all, certainly a lesson about God's faithfulness and the fragility of our own faith as we see ourselves even in the children of Israel. It's, it's a bit of a reflection. Again, like I say, we, we shouldn't be too proud that you know we, we scoff at them and think we would have done better. Uh, we may not have, but we see... God provides. We saw it with the manna. We saw it with the water. We saw it with the quail. God continues to provide. He's going to provide in other ways as well. Um, he provided when he delivered them in the, in the battle. Um, but also notice that God was the one who took them in chapter 17 to the place where there wasn't any water. Don't forget, God took them there. You know, what does that say to us? Do we think we're better than the Israelites? Do we think God's going to always treat us better? I guess that's a weird way to say it, but it's kind of how we think sometimes. I mean, that tells me that sometimes God in his providence, he might put me in a place where I have some lack as a test of my faith. He might put me somewhere where I can't really see where the provision's coming from right away. He might put me there on purpose. You know, I believe God does everything on purpose. Nothing's a coincidence or an accident. It's because of his providence. So in both ways he provides, but then in sometimes he puts them in certain situations to test that faith as well. 
And I think we get some lessons about leadership. We mentioned that one is the burden of leadership. If, if you want to sign up for leadership, or God calls you to lead in any level of significance, there's, there's a certain burden to it. Can you imagine being Moses? I mean, he didn't ask for it. <laughs> but if God speaks to you out of a burning bush, you know, you're probably going to sign up. And, and God's teaching him a lot. But, but what a burden he carried as a leader. And, and I think that should help us to be gracious to leaders in every walk of life, hopefully to your pastor, although you all make it easy. You just make this so easy. But, but think about just what's going on right now. Think about the issues that our governor is trying to handle. Think, think about the issues that the school board has been working through and trying to please all the parents and get students back to school. Think about the president of the United States. Think about all of our leaders and what our tendency is, is to do a lot like the children of Israel is to grumble and criticize and think of all the different ways we would do it. But the fact is we are not doing it. God's called them to do it and given them their place to do it. So a little bit of understanding and grace from us is probably what God would want, but but all leadership comes with a certain burden. And, um, and God's grace is sufficient for that. But then also we learn about this principle of delegation. Where did we see that? Yeah, the last thing we just went through. Um, no leader should think that they gotta do everything or can do everything. Or no leader should so be so proud as to think nobody can do it as good as me. I don't know if, that, if that's you, you know, if it's going to be done right, I'm going to do it. You know, some people are kind of like that. It, it, leadership is best exercised when it's a shared leadership, when you find good people to help you and do things they can do, and you understand that you shouldn't do everything. But part of leadership is helping others get on board to help you do the things that need to get done. And then lastly, I would say this. We must look for Christ in the Old Testament. And the reason is not because we're just using our imaginations, but because what we saw tonight, he's there. Christ is in the Old Testament. And sometimes we get into a habit of dividing, and I think it's kind of unfortunate that we call it Old Testament, New Testament, because sometimes we divide it. Jesus is in the New, but he's not in the Old. But he very much is in the Old Testament. And if you'll keep your eyes open and you're stepping back and you're seeing the big picture of God's story of salvation, you begin to see it. If you'll connect those key New Testament passages back, you see how God has revealed this. It's not just our imagination. God's revealed it to be so. So Jesus is the bread from heaven. Jesus is the rock from where the, the living water flowed. Jesus was there in the wilderness with the people. He was in the, the cloud and in the pillar of fire. Christ was there. All right. Any questions or comments? Yes. Well, see, that's a great question, Tom. But right. Well, Tom, that's, that's a great question. I observed the same thing. Even wrote a little note here, you know, that how does Moses know before the law is given what the statutes and the principles, instructions from the Lord are? And I believe that comes into his role as prophet. God is doing some immediate revelation with Moses. He's, he's, he's prophet. He's priest. This is why Moses is such a huge figure at this moment in the history, is he's God's man and um, God's mouthpiece until 
and we see the law being um, it's foreshadowed in a lot of things that are going on like the manna collection and the reverence for the sabbath that that's not a law yet but but they're getting them ready for it <laughs> and that one will be at the very heart of who the jewish people are sabbath observance so i think that's a great observation and i, I think all you can say is god was speaking directly through moses during this time until it got written down yeah that's a great great observation all right well it's time to quit continue to to read on we're we're going to finally get to the giving of the law uh, the ten commandments and all of that for for next time uh, be in prayer for folks in our church uh, especially please be praying for people who during this whole time it's been over four months now that we've been in this you know just who haven't been back yet and um you know, for, for their own reasons um, and safety reasons, most likely, and, and at risk reasons, just pray for them that they stay encouraged and uh, we can stay connected with them the best ways that we can. Pray for our Sunday school as it begins to reconnect and people begin to get back to that. I think that's very, very important. And, um, and pray for um, the Soup family, Brian and, and Brianna. Brianna had, had back surgery today. And um, if you are interested in helping that family maybe with a, a meal or something like that in the next couple of weeks uh, let me know call the church let deborah know we've got kind of a sign up thing going on uh, their sunday school class kind of started it our class is jumping in but but there's plenty of room for anybody that'd like to help uh, to jump in and help with that family he's military he has to work next week while she be, she'll be recovering they have four children too by the way and um, then he's get then he gets some leave where he'll be home for a while but that won't start until the week after. Uh, so um, lift them up in prayer and also help them out uh, if you can. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, just the joy of opening it up, studying it together. And Father, thank you for uh, uh, just helping us to understand it and making it so it is understandable. And Lord, thank you for how we're observing your story of redemption and and how you've written us into it. You've grafted us in through Christ. So help us to remember not just the content, but the lessons, uh, the matters of faith. And as we go through this week, as we go through day by day, may we exercise the kind of faith that you call the children of Israel to day by day, trusting you for what we need, not despairing, not grumbling, not criticizing leaders, but trusting you, believing that you are in firm control of all these things. So you guide us in faith, you guide us in wisdom. Lord, we pray for our congregation. We thank you for how you have been with us, how you have provided. Help us not to be forgetful of all of the good things you have done and are doing. Father, we lift up um, the suit family to you. Just be with Brian, be with Brianna. As, they, as she heals from this surgery and as you make provision for them and help us to love on them as we can. And um, Father, just be with us as we leave here now. And may we walk faithfully with Christ and we pray this in his name. Amen.